we are in the ending of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5 this morning in the book of Acts. Acts, turning to chapter 4, and we'll be beginning with verse 32, Acts 4, 32. Charles Spurgeon was a great Victorian Baptist preacher in London. He pastored a church there from the 1850s to the 1890s. And one day, someone walked up to him and told him that they were going to leave his church because they wanted to find the perfect church. Now, Spurgeon had a very quick wit, and he was often more outspoken than he probably would have gotten away with being today. They would have considered him very politically incorrect. He thought on his feet and he said, well, when you find it, please don't join it because you will ruin it. You get it? The moment we find the perfect church, when we join it, it's no longer perfect, right? <laughs> None of us is perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect church. Thank God for his forgiveness. Amen. <laughs> we are in Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. And this is a review. Um, last week, we looked at the, this chapter as well as the end of chapter 5, kind of tying that all together when Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin. And now today, we're going to look at an occurrence that took place in the midst of that, actually, okay? So we're going to review chapter 4, beginning with verse 32. It says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, beginning with chapter 5, verse 1. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, and I need us to notice right here, nobody had told Peter anything. This was all a word of knowledge given to him by the Holy Spirit. Peter said, Ananias... How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. A great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, he fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You think? <laughs> Interesting situation that the leaders of this brand new church, remember we've talked about, they had never gone through any of this before. Everything they encountered was new territory. And boy, oh boy, was this new territory. 
Nobody taught them in Bible college <laughs> how to deal with this kind of situation. Put yourself in Peter's situation as one of the leaders of this new movement and the Holy Spirit giving him the message that he received to confront Ananias and Sapphira. That took courage. So what really happened here? Luke, the historian, wanted to remind us of what the church was like in those early days. So we read that at the end of chapter 4. Now, he had also written about it at the end of chapter 2. He wasn't just repeating himself. He was setting the stage for what was to come at what is now the beginning of chapter 5. He's reminding us of the good things that were happening in the early church. He wanted to introduce us to Barnabas, who we will hear more about later on. And he wanted to make sure that we learned about Ananias and Sapphira. Good things were happening among the people in the church. There were good people in their midst, many of whom were doing what Barnabas did, selling property and donating money to the church. Now, why were they so willing and eager to give their possessions, to give their money, they no doubt were remembering what Jesus had taught in Matthew 24 about the destruction of Jerusalem. And that actually came about in A.D. 70. But when Jesus talked about it, he said that his people, the Christians, were to leave Jerusalem at that time. So they were in their own minds already holding loosely to their worldly possessions. And they had a heart for getting the gospel out and for helping each other in the body of Christ. So they were giving up their lands, their possessions, to help one another to spread the gospel. One among them, Barnabas, very generously made a sale and a donation. This made a very favorable impression on the people. They were greatly encouraged by what he did. And in fact, his name meant son of of encouragement. Do you know what your name means? If you don't, you should try find out. Seriously, it's interesting to find out what your name means. And then we sometimes need to ask ourselves, am I living up to my name? Barnabas made a very encouraging impression on the people. And perhaps wanting to also make a favorable impression were Ananias and Sapphira. It seems, with no intentions on Barnabas's part for this to happen, that his donation, his encouragement of the body, his recognition among the body, sparked maybe some jealousy, some competition in Ananias and Sapphira. Well, they made their sale. They sold their property. They perhaps intended to give all the proceeds at first, but then they changed their minds. They decided to withhold part of it, which actually they had every right to do. Peter said, before you sold the property, the property was yours. After you sold the property, the money was yours. Let's go way back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Exodus 20, does that ring a bell with anybody? What do we find in Exodus chapter 20? The Ten Commandments. Verse 15 says, Thou shalt not steal. Now, for something to be able to be stolen, it had to first be owned by somebody, right? So God is not saying throughout his word that we are not to own anything. We have the rights of ownership. Peter outlined that with Ananias. He didn't have to sell it. Ananias did not have to sell his property. He did not have to give any and certainly not all the proceeds to the church. The problem was not that Ananias did not give everything he had, but that he pretended to be giving it when actually he was holding back some. The problem was his hypocrisy and lying, not the fact that he owned property 
or sold it or gave only part of the proceeds. He gave only part of the proceeds but made everybody think he'd given it all. He was part of the church. And falsehood destroys its fellowship. It was a heart thing. It was a heart thing. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all, guard your heart. In what we do, in what we say, and in why we do it. God knows our thoughts. God knows our hearts. God knows our motives. He knows it all. He sees it all. It's all an open book to him. If you look in your bulletin, go ahead and pull it out right now. We're going to go through it together in a little bit. On the left side, about halfway down, we have one of God's Hebrew names. Yehovah El Emet. And they say their TH is kind of hard. Emet. Yehovah El Emet. Let's say it together. Ready? Yehovah El Emet. And what does it mean? The Lord God of truth. God will always be true to himself. He will always be true to his word. And saints, he will always be true to us. He's faithful. He will only tell us the truth. Our enemy, Satan, will only lie to us. He will either lie or he will twist the truth. Jesus called him the father of lies. That's all he can do. God, however, will always be the God of truth. Yehovah what? El Emet. Ananias and Sapphira didn't have a firm grasp on this part of God's nature. Not enough so to take it seriously. In verses 3 and 4 of chapter 5, it says, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you, prom you received for the land? Then the end of verse 4 says, You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. We see two things here. First of all, the role of Satan in this situation. Satan was outraged by what was taking place in the early church. He hated, he despised the unity and the generosity that he saw among the body of Christ. And so he devised the scheme to use that, those very things, that unity and that generosity against the church. I believe Peter learned from all this. I believe Peter logged all of these experiences. In 1 Peter chapter 5, he later wrote, verses 8 and 9, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Have you ever watched Nat Geo and watched a lion stalking? It's an amazing thing to watch. We have a kind of big black cat, and sometimes it's just fun to watch her stalk. She moves, and she's like, she's stalking dust, you know what I mean? It's, it's like nothing important, right? But there's that in them. Our enemy stalks us like a roaring lion, seeking to devour us, not just frighten us, devour us, destroy us. He seeks to kill, destroy. And then what does Peter say? Resist him. Resist him, standing firm 
in the faith. In other words, we are to be Akamai in the spirit enough to recognize what he's doing, to recognize his schemes, to acknowledge that's who and what it is, and resist. Just say no. It's not always so easy as a just. It takes a lot of strength to say no. But that's how we resist him. Say no. James also wrote about this, James 4, 7. He wrote, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's how we send the enemy running, is by resisting him, consistently, faithfully resisting him. Can we do it in our own strength? No, that's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need his help. We need his discernment. We need his strength. Saints, you and I may take this as a warning. When things are going well, God is answering prayers. God is blessing. God is using the church to bless the community. God is providing. Satan starts to get nervous and he will attack. If we're not being effective for the kingdom, we're not a threat to him and he leaves us alone. So, saints, it's actually a compliment when Satan begins to meddle in our lives, in our situations. It means we must be doing something right. We must be doing what God wants us to be doing because the enemy's getting nervous and he's attacking. James Montgomery Boyce wrote this. If you are really trying to do something for God, if your church is effective, if you have a strong missions program, if you have people who are out witnessing, if you're trying to embody the gospel in social programs that minister to the needs of real people and demonstrate the real love of Jesus, Satan will attack you. You will have to be on your guard against him. As a body, but as individual believers as well. None of us, none of us is exempt from Satan's schemes. We must be on our guard. Now, Satan is stronger than we are in our own strength, but Satan is not anywhere near as powerful as God. He wants to make us think that he is. He wants to make us think that he is the equal opposite of God, that he is just as powerful, just as smart, intelligent, wise, just as everywhere present. He's not. He was an angel. He is a fallen angel. He is a created being that is out against God, and he knows that we are the dearest thing to the heart of God. So how, how better to get at God than through us? We have to know all of this. We have to realize that he will never tell us the truth. He will only use the truth to confuse us, to deceive us, and he's really trying to get at the heart of God. We must watch out for him. Some have tried to resist the devil without first submitting to God and have found that the devil does not flee from them. The devil runs over us like a tank because he's more powerful than we are. We stand only when we first submit to God because only then do we stand in God's strength. Appropriate place for an amen. Amen. The only time we stand in God's strength is when we have first fully submitted ourselves to him. It is only because of God and his strength that the devil flees. How do we submit to God? Through prayer, in worship, knowing and using his word. Isn't that how Jesus overcame the temptation of Satan in the wilderness? He used the word of God. Whenever Satan came at him, Jesus responded with the word of God. But the word of God says, saints, how can we do that if we don't know the word of God? We need to be reading the word. We need to be studying the word. We need to be memorizing the word. We need to hide the word of God in our hearts that we might not, what, Brother Herbert? Sin against God. I 
I could ask it, but I won't. How many of us have memorized a scripture this year? This is August. Have we memorized any scripture yet this year? Come on, saints. We need to know the word of God because only as we know it can we stand on it. You've memorized? Good. All right. One more by next Sunday? Okay. <laughs> I take that as a nod. A child shall lead them. <laughs> Another thing that Peter reveals in what he said to Ananias Sin is always against God. It may offend others in the process, but sin is always against God. Verse 4, Peter said to him, you have not lied to men, but to God. He raised the situation to the highest possible level in saying those words. Because we were made in God's image as eternal beings, then what we do has eternal ramifications. Choices we make matter to God. And they matter to other people. Ananias and Sapphira's actions affected the whole church. You remember what it said twice? Great fear fell on the church and all who heard. Do you think the city heard about this? Did you hear what happened at the church last week? Two people fell down and died. What they did affected the church, the testimony of the church, and the entire city. What about Sapphira? It says Ananias did what he did with his wife's full knowledge. She was complicit. She was an accomplice. They both had the same lie. If and when we try to excuse ourselves for our wrong, we're actually trying to shift the blame onto God. Have you ever heard someone say, well, that's just the way I am? In saying that, we're saying, that's the way God made me. If we say, well, I just, I can't help myself. We're saying, God isn't big, wise, or strong enough to help me to not do that. Anytime we make an excuse, we're blaming God. Peter, again, probably remembered this experience when he wrote in 1 Peter 4.17, it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel? In other words, Peter is saying, just because we are the people of God does not mean that we get a buy when it comes to being held accountable for sin. So to look at this as a whole, first of all, this was the first time that this new group of believers was called the church. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about it. We learn from this that Satan's attacks against the church are not always from outside the fellowship, but sometimes from within. We need to watch ourselves. We need to be accountable to one another. Experiences such as this and others in Scripture, in Romans 15, 4, we're told are for us to learn from. And if we were to go back into the Old Testament, I want to draw our attention to a couple of instances where something rather similar took place. From it, we may gain insight into the God of truth. Yehovah what? El Emet. 
In the book of Leviticus, <laughs> knew we marveled this morning in Sunday school class that someone actually got something out of the book of Numbers. There's some really good stories hidden in the book of Numbers, by the way, if you dig through the numbers. <laughs> Leviticus also. The sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, had a promising future in the priesthood. The holy God of Israel had personally set them apart to serve as priests. Their family pedigree was rich and their preparation extensive. They were dressed in fresh robes and sashes. The turbans on their heads held a golden plate boasting, Holy is the Lord. Blood from their ordination offering was crusted on their ears, thumbs, and toes. Their hearts were still awestruck from seeing the fire that came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. They were set apart to serve God, but not for long. The opening verses of Leviticus 10 read, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Their ordination processes likely lasted longer than their ministries. Their unauthorized fire was met with an unquenchable one. God killed them on the spot in dramatic fashion. Nadab and Abihu's sudden death raises a lot of questions. What exactly was this strange fire? Did they use the wrong incense? Did they come at the wrong time? Did they enter the Holy of Holies? Were they drunk? Did they offer incense to a false god? We can't be certain. We can be certain, however, that they knew the clear command concerning the altar. You shall not offer unauthorized incense on it. Yet for some reason, they shrugged off the warning and paid for it dearly. Stories like this are included in Scripture to instruct us. God wants us to pause and ponder, what should we learn from their fiery death? Here are three lessons. There are no small sins before God. There are no small sins. There's no such thing as a white lie. A lie is a lie is a lie is a lie. White, black, or purple. There's no such thing as a small sin. Secondly, the way we worship matters. The way we worship matters. Do we come to worship prepared to worship? I'm not even talking about what other people see on the outside. I'm talking about what only God sees and what we know on the inside. Is our heart prepared for worship? It matters how we worship. And we also learn from this, which is another whole message, we need a better priest Nadab and Abihu were everything we would not want in a priest. And this very experience was pointing to the better priest, Jesus. The only one who is qualified to stand between God and man. There's another experience in the Old Testament concerning David. After David became king... He desired to make the Ark of the Covenant central in Hebrew worship. David was a worshiper from deep down inside, inside out and backwards. David was a worshiper. And it was his heartbeat to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. The Ark had actually been in captivity. And so he wanted to bring the Ark back to Jerusalem where it would once again be central in his people's worship. It needed 
to come back to Jerusalem from obscurity. So they did what they thought best. Now, here's inter it's, it's interesting. David is a worshiper. David knew God. But he never thought to consult God about how to bring the ark back. They just came up with their best idea. Well, let's build a cart. So it was a new cart, but it was a cart. God had commanded that the ark was only to be carried on the shoulders of men. But they built an ox cart. Uzzah, U-Z-Z-A-H, was one of the men who was to walk alongside the Ark of the Covenant as it was brought back to Jerusalem on this ox cart. Well, it must have gone over. It must have had potholes like we have, yeah? That's a joke, okay? Um, anyway, <laughs> the Ark began to wobble. And just, wouldn't it be the natural thing, and that was the whole problem, <laughs> the natural thing that Uzzah did was to reach out his hand and steady the cart. And in so doing, he was instantly struck dead. Now, I always thought when I was a little kid, I always thought, that just seems so unfair. It just seems like such an ungodlike thing to do. But this is what happened. Those responsible for the moving of the cart, including David, did not consult with God as to how the ark was to be moved. God had given clear instructions in the Torah on how to move the ark. Why? because God wanted to emphasize his holiness, his utter separateness and blazing purity. This golden box, this law of God written on stone tablets by God's own fingers within it, the mercy seat covering it, the whole thing points to the glory, holiness, and grace of God himself, incomparable and unique, sovereign and majestic, worthy and beautiful. And God says, when the ark moves, let it rest on the shoulders of men, not on the back of a cart like harvest that you're taking to the market. This is different. The ark is unique in all of Israel, even in its transportation. Where's the gospel here? Where's the grace of God for us here? It's hidden in this act of judgment. If Israel wasn't going to honor God by obeying his simple instructions, what would they fudge on next? Church, if you and I aren't going to obey God in the little things, even scripture tells us he's not going to trust us with the big things. It was gracious of God to bring them back into the holy fear and reverence of his great name. I think as humans wanting to serve God, we get ahead of ourselves sometimes. We start off well, but then we do our own thing and hope that God blesses it. We don't take the time to search his scriptures or seek his face, asking, what does God want from us here? This was God's reminder to his people in the Old Testament and in Ananias and Sapphira's experience, and to us today, who it is that we are serving. He is a God of power and might. He is a God who is more holy than we can even begin to comprehend, church. How dare we come blithely into the presence of God and sing some songs and maybe close our eyes during the prayer time just to be proper. God is infinitely more holy than we can even comprehend. How does he deserve to be worshipped? That's how he is to be worshipped, in spirit 
and in truth. Let everything that is within me, David wrote, bless his name because he deserves nothing less and nothing else. dare we seem bored in the presence of God? Is God bored when we approach him in prayer? Does he bide his time with us? Oh, he's not done yet. Let everything that is within me, mind, body, spirit, soul, let everything that is within me bless his name because of who he is. Because if we don't, the rocks will. God will be praised whether you choose to do it or not, whether I choose to do it or not. God will be praised. The Bible talks about the ocean lifting its voice, about the trees clapping their hands. God will be praised. Because he is infinitely more worthy than we can even imagine. You know, we we read the word, we... We read the word, we sing songs, which we're going to do in a little while, about heaven, about what heaven will be like, about what we look forward to. But you know what? I think a whole lot of us are still going to be in complete shock when we actually stand in God's presence in heaven and realize the magnitude of who he is, of every nation, tribe, kindred, Lifting their, will they all be speaking English? I don't think so. Every nation, kingdom, tribe will be speaking what they've known. It will be this incredible cacophony of everybody worshiping God because he deserves it. Because he receives it. Can you imagine what that will be like? I love that song, I can only imagine. Will I bow to my knees? Will I stand? What will that be like? What will that be like? I can only imagine what it will be like when we see Jesus, when we stand around his throne, when we kneel in his presence, when we cast the crowns that he's just given us at his feet in worship, thereby saying, none of the glory goes to me. All of the glory goes to the Lamb of God. A God who is more holy than we can ever begin to conceive, and yet a God who gives us an Ark of the Covenant, the God who gives us a mercy seat, and a God who gives us the Ten Commandments to draw us close to him. Since the very beginning of time with God, it's always been he wants us close. He wants us with him. Even today, the Holy Spirit draws us to him out of our sin to put on his robe of righteousness. And then once we've done that, the Holy Spirit still draws us closer to him, convicts us of sin, and draws us closer to him. The God who gives us the Passover lamb whose blood delivers us. In his wrath, he remembers mercy. Aren't you thankful for that? That when we sin... 
And God must be angry at our sin because he's a holy God. But in his wrath, he remembers mercy because he loves us so much that he gave his son to die for us. He remembers. Oh, that's right. I love them. I love them. So yes, God is the God who struck down Ananias and Sapphira. I believe the church got the message that day, God is holy and God means business. Now in our times of living in grace, living under grace, sometimes we forget that we got that memo, that God is holy. And he is to be approached, he is to be worshiped as a holy God. I am a friend of God. We sing rather lightly about God sometimes, and that's okay. It gives us, gives us a different perspective because God tells us in his word. He spoke of Abraham as being the friend of God. Yeah. It's an awesome perspective. But church, let's remember, we are friends of a holy God. And an almighty God. You know, I'm, this whole cup of kahi service today uh, got put together in about 10 minutes because of situations that came up last minute. But I'm glad that it did. God knew what he was doing because we get to hear this word. We get to be reminded of the holiness, the utter separateness of who God is compared to us. And we can come before his presence as we always should, with joy, with thanksgiving, with grateful hearts, but with a reminded spirit of who God is. May our desire to serve the Lord zealously as David desired. He wanted the ark to be brought back to its place of centrality in their worship. That was a great thing. But in his zeal, he kind of didn't think. He didn't plan. He didn't consult God. He went ahead and acted and then said, oh God, can you bless this? How many times do we do that? We do our own thing and, oh God, can you bless it? Needs to be the other way around. Are we even doing what God's idea is? Because only then will he bless it. May our desire to serve the Lord zealously be matched by our desire to seek his face and search his scriptures so that we can serve him in the ways that will bring him the most glory. Because church, what Ananias and Sapphira did detracted from the glory of God in their midst and the testimony of the church in the midst of the city. May we think about what we do. Not just run out there and do it. <laughs> But make sure we remember we're approaching, we are living for a holy God who is seeking for holy people to call upon his name, to spread his word, to be Christians, little Christs, before a very much watching world. The world watches us. They don't want to admit it. 
They won't ever tell us when we've done a good job. <laughs> but they're watching. Whether they live in the same house we do, or down the street, or somewhere else. Or we work with them. Or we ride the bus with them. They're watching once they find out we're a Christian. Because you know what? They sometimes know better what we should be doing than we do. God, remind us constantly you are holy. You are holy. Because you are holy, because you are God, because you are all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present, because you are completely other than we are God, you deserve all the glory, all the worship. And God, in this moment, we determine that our hearts before you will be pure. Forgive us, Lord God, for sins that we've committed. Forgive us, God, for bad attitudes. Forgive us, Lord, for inappropriate speech coming from our mouths. Forgive us, God, for actions that don't indicate, as we, as we saw about the disciples in Acts chapter 4, people could tell that they had been with Jesus. May people be able to tell that we have been with Jesus. Not just that we've been to church. Anybody can go to church. But have we been with Jesus? Holy Spirit, right now, we give you all the liberty in our hearts because that's the only heart we're responsible for is our own change us God change our hearts may our zeal and our excitement for you match the desire within us to worship you for who you are